Hello and welcome to Ask Lovecraft After Dark. We are joined tonight by creative director Lauren Penabinto. Lauren, welcome. Hello, I'm excited to be here. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Lauren and I met, th uh, I think we were both at Necronomicon four years ago, was it? Yeah, I've been to all of them, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because I was, I was friends with Mallory O'Meara, a uh, celebrated author, Mallory O'Meara. And I think, uh, yeah, just in the sort of the Brownian motion of the cons, we uh, we uh, got to know each other uh, through the various uh, just bouncing arounds and whatnot. I, I think uh, I recognize yeah. you because I had already seen Ask Lovecraft and thought it was uh, oh hilarious. okay oh that's fantastic. I I never assume anyone is aware of this bizarre show that I do. So <laughs> that's uh... <laughs> oh we frozen for just a minute. So uh, while. Uh, Lawrence connection uh, works its way out. Uh, uh, I'll let sort of folks have an idea. Uh, Lauren is a creative director uh, for Orbit Books, which is an uh, imprint of Hatchet. And essentially, uh, she is responsible for. Oh, yeah, you're back. Hello. Okay, good. Hi. I was Sorry. starting to go in. I was starting to go into your CV just to, to keep people going. <laughs> oh, please, by all means. <laughs> uh, well, uh, correct me if I am uh, mistaken, but you're a creative director over at Orbit Books, uh, uh, imprint of Hachette. That's largely responsible for science fiction fantasy. Does that sort of? Oh dear. Uh, uh, folks, uh, the the covers that we have uh, <laughs> here in my household are uh, Anne Leckie's uh, uh, series, the Ancillary series. Uh, but uh, you can go and see, there's a great tour write up of all the various stuff that uh, they've worked on over time. And, uh, oh, are you back? Yeah, I am. There we go. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're dealing with a little bit of freezing tonight. Right. Um, nope, nope, that's all right. Okay. Um, I was just showing examples of some of the stuff that Orbit uh, has put out. I love it. Oh dear, okay. Uh, this is going to be uh, an interesting, slightly one-sided conversation, uh, at least uh, until uh, we uh, work out these uh, sort of technical kinks. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, the work that she's done uh, for a bit, she's been uh, at there for uh, over 10 years now. And the uh, you can just go and see, uh, if you go to laurenpenapento.com, she's got a whole lot of uh, stuff that she's done to show uh, not only what she does as a creative director, which once uh, her uh, connection issues work out, she'll tell us about. Um, but you can also see uh, sort of the process of going through. There was a really uh, fantastic write-up she did for uh, one of her, uh, for the Muddy Color uh, sort of blog site of artists, uh, where she goes through and sort of explains sort of step-by-step. -step. Oh, hello. Hi. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hello, sorry. welcome back. I don't know what's happening. I don't know. I don't know who's my internet. Um, sorry. Google go, the Google gods giveth and the Google gods taketh away. Okay. Well, I'm gonna make your window much smaller. So hopefully that. <laughs> that's <help. laughs> that's fine. Uh, I was I'll tell folks where they can find sort of some of the uh, information about what you do. Uh, I'm gonna throw this into the chat right now. There's a great uh, article you did over at Muddy Colors uh, for some of your processes of just right. what it goes into being a creative director, which I guess I don't need to explain. Why don't you tell folks, what does it mean to be a creative director? <laughs> well, um, a creative director is someone who's not just in charge of, in, in, as far as publishing goes, who's not just in charge of individual book titles, but is in charge of um, deciding what, uh, like who works on what books. And you know, it, it, the way I ex describe it is it's not enough to just do a good cover. It has to look like an orbit cover. So, um, you know, that means different things, you know, depending upon, you know, what kind of book it is and what kind of season it is. But I have to keep kind of like a top level, um, you know, view on what the trends are in, in sci-fi. Like, it's not just enough to say, okay, well, this is the trend in sci-fi and this is the trend in fantasy. You have to keep an eye on what's space opera, what's epic fantasy, what's adventure fantasy, what's steampunk. Or what's you know uh, historical fantasy? Like all of these like little subgenres all have their own kind of mini currents and trends going on. Uh, so I spend a lot of time on the internet <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of time at cons, um, and I'm always keeping tabs on artists who are developing and what they're doing, and you know not just in books, but what's going on in movies and what's going on in fashion because that'll um, inform a lot of 
just pop culture trends and where that kind of stuff is going. So uh, the editors, we work in seasons. So our season is six months long. So at the beginning of a season, uh, the editors will have put together a list and they start briefing all the titles on that list to me and my team. I have two designers that work with me. And, uh, you know, it'll be like, this is our new epic fantasy from so-and-so. And it's, you know, like Game of Thrones crossed with, uh, Bob's Burgers, and you need to do a cover for it, and uh, you know, and and so on and so on, and and we have a cover meeting every week, so covers will be in different stages of the process as we go through that six month season. So some covers will be getting briefed, and I will be uh, presenting ideas for directions of covers. Uh, you know, like whether a cover is illustrated or it uses a photo or it's just a kind of a type design or designed in house. Um, and then we just go through the season and hopefully by the end of six months, we have a whole season all done and beautiful. And we present that to sales and then sales, all the sales reps take those covers and start selling the books. And then we start all over. So, uh, I worked in, I worked in book retail for a long time. So saw the kind of the other side of this, you know, seeing, you know, books and covers coming in um, and you definitely could see trends. You could see kind of relationships between, you know, sort of there'd be this big, massive, you know, sales like, you know, Game of Thrones would suddenly explode. Um, and then you would start to see kind of copycats of it, which I found really fascinating. Um, uh, when Lauren comes back, I will ask a bit more about this, but you could, I think it's, you know, the cover art is something that's a kind of a, an unseen yet incredibly visible process. Like every one of us who reads, like, you know, we know like what our books look like. We know like the books we came to, like I came to reading genre, you know, read genre fiction because my brothers had a bunch of sci-fi fantasy novels and I like the cool swords and like violence and monsters on those covers more than I like the like, pictures of like poisoned tea which is what were my mom's murder mysteries <laughs> poison tea <laughs> right like well what I, what I was talking about i worked book retail for a long time and would see covers you know like come and you know sort of come and go and you would sort of begin to see okay like when twilight blew up then we saw this whole range of kind of copycat twilight oh, you know black with the red you know font um it happened again with uh, the uh the el james books mm -hmm. um and uh, uh, I think we Hunger Games, we saw a little bit of, of, of copycatting. Uh, is, is, there, is, it, is there a specific term within the industry beyond just copycatting or, you know, when like there is this sort of like explosion? There will be, there will be one cover that like changes a whole genre. Um, and then the whole, the currents will come. I mean, it, it depends on the house that you're in, in each genre. You know, some houses are trying to push the envelope. Some are, are kind of, solidly in the middle of the fan base and some are kind of lagging behind. So at Orbit um, and, and props to my publisher for, for feeling this way, like we try to keep pushing the envelope design wise and, and publishing wise um, as much as we can. And just kind of, uh, sometimes that means you get a little ahead of the audience and there's definitely been covers that I've done that I like to think are too cool, but are maybe just a little weird. We have, um, we have something called genre checkpoints in the industry. And, um, I've realized that it, you know, either like say for, for whatever given book, um, you know, like if it's steampunk, the genre checkpoints would be gears and clockwork or something like that. And, um, and if you are going to have the, the really standard genre checkpoints, then you can be a little more experimental on the art style or something like that. If you're not gonna have really obvious genre checkpoints, then you do need to stay very close to a, like a an expected style for that genre. So you can kind of move forward in half steps, but you still have to leave like a trail of breadcrumbs for the fans to get to, or else you just, you know, kind of do a weird thing and nobody gets it and it doesn't sell. And then the, you know, there's no good for anybody. Well, I mean, one thing I was talking about, uh was you know what you do is this kind of invisible yet incredibly visible process right like we're all used to book covers you know we know like we we have read i have read books solely based on their book cover you know and yet what goes into that i think there's this idea that you know the author either the author just drew it which i think uh, is a very rare thing yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. or that there's just sort of like art that's out there and it somehow kind of magically all gets combined together um 
But, you know, your work, essentially, I, it, it feels to me from what I've read, is almost like, you know, one of those UN translators trying to, like, you know, get writer yeah. to artist to, like, communicate, even though they speak in different languages. And, like, how does that process usually play out when it's um, the way it's supposed to? I do I do feel like a, a very, like, high-pressure UN translator all the time. It's like Russia and Japan and the U.S., everybody's fighting all the time. And I'm just, like, in the middle, like, looking harried and, like... <sighs> You know, because like artists don't speak author and author doesn't always speak editor and editor doesn't always speak publisher. And we're all kind of in the middle. Um, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to like maniacally please everyone <laughs> at once. <laughs> um, I, you know, sometimes I, I I I pay my therapist to figure out why that is. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I think you can't be an art director unless you have this like you're raised with this like maniacal need to like please people. I don't know. Um, but it, but, but it, in a good way, it, it really is magic when, um, you can take an author's words and ideas and really give them a cover that, that they love and that the fans really respond to and just like really embodies the book and like on its best days, it, it, it all just works, but it is funny, you know, like the thing people always say when they hear I'm a book designer, the first thing they're like, they're like, Oh, you can't judge a book by its cover. You know, and I'm like, actually, that's what what it's for. <laughs> please, please judge. <laughs> please judge the book by its cover, or else my job is meaningless. <laughs> like, um, but everybody judges a book by its cover all the time, um, and and you should. And sometimes that causes some friction because sometimes, um, you know, the some friction can happen when either an editor or an author is is really close to a book. Obviously, they've been working on this for a really long time. Um, and they're thinking about the cover from the point of view of somebody who has already read the book. Whereas what the cover's purpose really is, is, an is advertising to people who have not read the book. Now, you don't want to be untrue to whatever's in the book, but sometimes um, catching somebody's eye or uh, letting people know what the reading experience of the book is, is much more important than showing like, we say, you're, hey, it's after dark. I'm going to say this. So like 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag, you know? Because um, <laughs> authors want to get everything in there most of the time. They're like, oh, but this is really cool. And this is really cool. And this is really cool. I'm like, that is really cool. But if it's too busy, nobody's going to see anything. <laughs> so, uh, then it's like those uh, early Discworld novels that were just <laughs> this like, like riotous shoggoth of just colors and like just, I mean, I remember, you know, I have a bunch of those, like the old, oh, yeah. uh, you know, ones that I just sort of look at them and I'm like, I, I've read this book. I think I know what this is supposed to represent. Yeah. Um, but then you get the, the the you know the newer ones where it's just like blue with like you know one like you know sort of silhouette of a rose. And I'm like, I mean that tells I guess that tells me something, but that that does make yeah. me kind of miss just the weird pustulous riot chaos of you know the old like that feels more like Discworld to me. Right? There's not enough pustules on book covers. It's really <laughs> what this conversation. Well, and and you know like I remember because I had. You know, I was a Game of Thrones, you know, hipster. No, I mean, but I got into Game of Thrones back when it had more like 80s, 90s style art of just like, look, people with swords and beards on a cover. Absolutely. And and then when it, it began to explode, you know, 10, 15 years later, and you got the very simple, you know, lion, you know, embossed lion, embossed wolf, you know, it was, it looked more respectable, but it 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 it's interesting how the styles really you know both not just genre but almost time right like when you see a book from the 70s you're like oh hello well also you've got to remember the the geek world like genre and mainstream have gotten closer and closer like in the 60s and 70s they were not even in the same stores practically and now i mean mainstream and and genre are so close um if you are in if you like game of thrones being a good example but there's other ones too you'll see when there are books that are expected to have mainstream crossover, they will be much more designed and much less illustrated because illustration oh, okay. is, is much more a signal to uh, genre, whether it's genre fans of movies, genre fans of video games or genre fans of, of illustrated art and books. So there's almost a, a spectrum of, you know, like how mainstream something is expected to be and how, much more type and design graphic design it is versus illustration so and is that something that you've seen 
that kind of divide get bigger and bigger as as time has gone on? Because I mean, you know, I think again back to those old books from the seventies and eighties that have the kind of like you know sort of light colored pencil drawing of like a sandy haired boy with his dog, you know, or like you know like the kind of old yeller classic style stuff, right? But those back then, I think um, it was less expected that a sci fi fantasy book could be a mainstream bestseller. Sure. So it really played directly to the genre fans, which are still today very much more illustration fans. Um, and whereas, and I think there's less of this today, like in the last 10 years, you know, geek stuff has become so mainstream. I mean, movies and, and Game of Thrones and books even, you know, it's not embarrassing for somebody to walk around with a sci-fi fantasy paperback in their hand. Um, but in the 70s, I think it kind of was, you know, like you wanted to hide that weird pustule laden shaga, <laughs> you know, like you were a weirdo if you read, you know, Lovecraft, you know, back then. And you're not so, you're not considered so weird now. Like it's been very strange for me, like as a, a younger person I might be dating myself but the first movie I remember seeing in the theater was Return of the Jedi but growing up kids who like Star Wars were the weirdos and now all the popular kids like Star Wars I don't have any kids but my friends that have kids it's the popular kids in school that have the Star Wars birthday parties and things like that and I'm like wow this is like a 180 in culture kind of well see that's funny because Star Wars for me it felt like it was one of the big genre things to have the mass appeal, right? I mean, like it redefined toys, it redefined like marketing, you know, like there were, you know, Star Wars bed sheets. <laughs> yeah. Well, as time went on, yeah, that became absolutely the mainstream thing. I think that might've been one of the first things that really went that big mainstream. No. And, and so, and yeah, to have it be this thing, but then, you know, Battlestar Galactica kind of, you know, <laughs> again, was sort of more sort of, you know, the other genre stuff that was out there. Uh, you know, Lord of the Rings was still this kind of private held thing. And as someone who, you know, now is in the Lovecraft world, it's interesting to see that tension of, you know, kind of old school folks who have been, you know, loving Lovecraft for decades and, you know, have been part of it with kind of newer folks who know it because of like all the board games and the role playing games. And yeah. just like the fact that Lovecraft and Cthulhu have become like the sort of McDonald arches of <laughs> weird horror, you know, like, no, but they're this, yeah. it's a, it's a giant branding thing, right? I'm, you know, like if you want to say, "Hey, Eldritch Horror is somewhere how involved with this," put a tentacle on it, right? Right, right. Which is interesting because you hear um, rumors, and I won't reveal like necessarily if I've seen art that should be NDA or not. But um, you know, there are Lovecraft projects around and in the works where it's been specifically said, "Do not use tentacles because that's been too done." And if you go back to Lovecraft, like, yeah, there's tentacles, but there was, we've lost the concept of this, um, you know, so dreadful that your brain can't even see it, you know? Like, what is, what is you know, non-Euclidean geometry look like? That's like the nightmare for every Lovecraftian book designer ever. I, you know? I, I will point out that my best friend, uh, when he went to college, actually had a leg up in studying non-Euclidean geometry because we grew up in Nashville and driving in Nashville teaches you, like, how to think outside of time and space, so... <laughs> Awesome. Well, <laughs> you do have parallel lines that intersect. I'm just saying, you know, like, you know, there's, there's, there's ways to demonstrate it. It just is, uh, you know, not where you would, you would find. Right. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. You're talking about, you know, the sort of the intersection of kind of the geeks, you know, geek sphere with the mainstream, uh, cause you spent time in a comic book show, right? Didn't you, didn't you like work for, uh, you know, selling comics for a while? How, like, how did that prepare you for this? <laughs> well, I, there was a comic book store, Jim Hanley's Universe, in Staten Island. I went to high school in Staten Island, New York, and um, I had the the joy, probably the the terror of my mother. My school, but like my the public bus that I took to school between the bus stop and my school was the comic book store. So once I started high school, I was just in there so much. I mean, I had been there earlier, but. I was just in there so much like, oh, I'll meet the next bus. Oh, there's another bus in 10 minutes, you know, that that Jim Hanley himself finally after a while, I think it, by the end of freshman year was like, do you just want to work here? Like, <laughs> you're just here every day. Do you want to work isn't here? That, isn't, that isn't that literally what happens in um, 
Oh, uh, uh, high fidelity. Isn't that like how oh, those yeah. guys got their job? <laughs> yeah, it's the dream. I was living the dream. Um, and I went home and I told my mom and she was like, absolutely not. You're not, you're in soccer. You're getting good grades. You're not working. So then sophomore year happened and Jim Hanley asked again. And my mom was like, no. So finally by junior year, I had spent so much time in this comic book store. My mom just gave up. And when Jim Hanley Mr. Jim Hanley called her. She was like, fine, just give her a job. She's not going to come home anyway. So, <laughs> um, and that started my career as, you know, comic book store girl slash uh, Magic the Gathering shark. Because oh. I, the girl in the store, there was another girl that worked in the store too. But between the two of us, you know, like all the guys would want to come in the store and like beat the girl at Magic. And I would be like, oh yeah, I've played this once or twice. Like Black Lotus, Icy Mipulator. Ah. <laughs> so I, I enjoyed my enjoyed my role but also um it was great because especially as a as a budding artist I got to see everything and read everything that I couldn't have ever afforded to to actually buy um but it was my job to be knowledgeable about this kind of stuff and and Jim Hanley loved it if I sat at the counter and like traced you know scud the disposable assassin comics at the at the counter he didn't care he thought it was great so, yeah, so that led, I mean, that job kept me right into to art school. I went to school of visual arts. So, and I worked like summers still in between. Um, yeah, and just, I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say like, like fell in love with graphic design. I was already doing like punk rock zines and kind of my own like drawing comic books and stuff. Um, and, and just like fell in love with graphic design and, you know, school of visual arts had a lot of great, uh, connections in the field. So I got a job before I even graduated. Actually, I, I skipped a couple, like the last couple months of classes to work at St. Martin's Press. Um, and then I worked at, then I got a job at Doubleday and then I got a job at Orbit, which was fantastic. So I've just always been in books. I can never leave, you know. <laughs> and, and what direction was your art sort of taking at this early point? Was it mostly a kind of illustration or, or more graphic design or kind of a hodgepodge? I mean, when I was in the comic book store, it was a lot of like Jim Lee era X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, but but illustration was never really my forte, although I, I was really good at copying stuff. I actually, um, if you look at my old sketchbooks, I, I've had sketchbooks forever, but I was actually copying like logos and, and type styles and things. Oh, interesting. Um, all my friends were in punk bands and I was hopeless at music. Um, so I would do the posters and the t-shirts and the logos and everything. And I didn't know that that was graphic design. I didn't know that was a job. So, um, so I actually went to school for two years in Boston. I went to Boston university for two years because I thought I could be a medical illustrator. I really like science. Um, and so I went pre-med with a minor in art and thought I could be a medical illustrator or something. Um, and then I took a graphic design class and I was like, Oh shit, this is, this is it. They're, these are people that make zines and logos all day. So I love <laughs> that. So then I, I transferred home. I'm from New York originally. So I transferred home and went to school of visual arts, which is what everybody said. If you want to get into graphic design, you should go there. So, um, and then it's just kind of been a straight shot into publishing. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, we're going to pause this interview just briefly. Speaking of amazing designs, uh, we still have a number of these delightful pins from our fine friends at Arkham Bazaar and uh, the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival and Cthulhu Con. Uh, and we're, yeah, we're still giving them away. So uh, just like before, if you would like to win one of these delightful pins, all you have to do is email asklovecraft at gmail.com with the subject line, Lauren Penapinto. And uh, let's see, what should... Uh, <laughs> whatever you can find and uh in the in the subject line uh or not subject line but in the in the body why don't uh why don't you talk about what what comic book character you either uh made up uh ripped off uh or just absolutely identified with uh growing up there we go awesome do i get to read these i want to read these <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll send them on because uh, I definitely I couldn't draw at all. I mean, I, you know, I had lots and lots of like just really awful fantasy like Dungeons and Dragons, you know, bloody swords and stuff. Um, but I I definitely had like a very rich, completely like ripped off the X-Men comic book universe in my head uh, that was going to, you know, that was going to put me on the map. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> everyone was going to thrill to the adventures of Dark Shadow. Um so now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Now, since then, uh, you've gone from studying art design, studying uh, graphic design to educating. You have a whole program, the uh, Drawn and Drafted program. Uh, can you tell folks about that and how you sort of you've gone to be, I don't know, a, a, an art guru in the last few years? <laughs> well, um, art school is great for learning technique. Um, but once I was uh, at Orbit, especially in working as a creative director and an art director, you realize very quickly that artists, um, whether they went to, to a traditional art program or not, um, aren't taught a lot of things, business side things that you really need to have any kind of creative career. So, um, you know, how to negotiate fees, how to talk about contracts and licensing and rights, um, you know, how to promote yourself on social media, how to be professional, how to like write professional emails, how to network, you know, um, without getting drunk and puking all over your art director, which has <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> okay. I imagine that's I imagine that's not a particularly fun part of the job. Yeah, I've only gotten puked on once. It's okay. okay. Um, <laughs> but everyone gets one. No, no, gets no, no, no. <laughs> I forgave them. Um, it wasn't. It was fine. It's a long story. <laughs> uh, it's after dark, but it's not that long after dark. <laughs> um, and uh, a couple of the other art directors, I go to a lot of conventions, um, you know, Comic-Con, Spectrum Fantastic Art, Illixcon, Necronomicon, and I do portfolio reviews. And it was happening that the first, you know, five minutes of a 10 minute portfolio review was always the artist kind of asking these art business questions. And I said, and then we had very little time to talk about art. And I said, okay, well, what if we make a cheat sheet? And I talked to a bunch of other art directors in sci-fi fantasy. I was like, what if we make a cheat sheet that answers all like the top 10 questions that artists always ask, you know, like, how do I email art directors? What should I have in my portfolio? Like all the basic stuff and just hand it out at the beginning of portfolio reviews. And then we just skip answering the same question over and over again and just talk about art. So out of that um, birth, uh, these one sheets. So we made these like downloadable PDF one sheets, which you can get at drawnanddrafted.com and uh, for free or they'll pay what you want on Gumroad. We accept tips. Um, and there's one on social media. There's one on how to build a portfolio. There's one on contracts and money. There's one on confidence. There's one on networking. There's a bunch of them. There's about what, 10 of them. Um, and it's, it Oh, we have another uh, frozen outro. Uh, yeah, folks can go to uh, John Drafted. It's a, a really fantastic resource. Uh, uh, I've just been perusing and you can see a great deal about what they do and how they're able to to communicate the stuff. Because you know, as an actor uh, going through drama school and and learning about you know learning about acting, it's we had we had the same issue, right? The only time I remember being taught about business or taught about how to get involved, you know, in the business side of acting was when in a film course where uh, the teacher essentially told us like, if you're going to be interested in film go be a PA and don't be drunk and show up on time and do what people tell you and you'll sort of work your way up. Yeah. Uh, oh, there, and we're back. Hello. I was talking, I was talking about how I, you know, growing, doing, doing drama school, I had a similar issue where we were not taught the business of drama, you know, like how to like find an agent, how to like work with unions or not with unions, you know, like there's this whole other side of things. I learned a lot about Aristotle, but that's not the same right. as learning how much you should be paid to do a thing. And technique is really important, but um, but yeah, like I said, we it it's a it's a failing in most art schools that you're not, and all a lot of creative schools, not just art, that that you don't learn enough about, you know, how to write a contract, how to keep yourself from getting screwed over, you know. Um, so what ended up happening was these one sheets got so popular that conventions started asking us to do seminars that were explanations of the one sheets. So we would do art business boot camps, we call them at seminar, at conventions. And then people who couldn't get to the conventions were hearing about these sessions and then they were very upset that they couldn't get to them. Um, so then we put them online. So you can get to everything through drawnanddrafted.com, the PDFs, the online uh, classes, things like that. We try to keep everything, we do have to charge a little bit for the online classes um, just to, to keep the, the site alive, I'm sure you understand. Um, and uh, But other than that, everything else, we, we make as much free as possible. We have a anonymous inbox called Dear Art Director where you can ask questions and one of the dozen of us that works on the site will, will answer them with like snappy gifts.
um, things like that. So, uh, so yeah, if you, and it's not just for artists, the authors, um, all kinds of things. Mallory did a class with us. It was called the art of the pitch and it was how to talk about your work, how to write emails to, to interested parties, you know, how to, how to write a professional pitch for whatever your project is to give to either an editor or an agent or a collaborator or something like that. That was not to, to apologize for your art, which is, I think, a huge one. <laughs> yes. How to be confident, um, how not to apologize. Um, pretty much, honestly, I think uh, I was talking about this with someone um, recently because I'm prepping for Artisticon this weekend in Philadelphia. If anybody's in the Philly area, Artisticon is this weekend at Moore College of Art, and I'm going to be doing art business boot camps. And then next weekend in Kansas City is Spectrum, uh, part of uh, Planet Comic Con, and I'm going to be doing boot camps again. Uh, so if you're near those two places, come on out. But um, I was talking to somebody, and I said, honestly, I think the most valuable part of, of what we do with Drone and Drafted is just like artists and authors, and creative people, just hearing that other creative people have the same problems and they can pool their resources. We have Facebook groups and things. Um, you just answer each other's questions and pool resources and realize like, you know, it, it doesn't have to be so, you don't have to be feel so lonely or like feel embarrassed to ask the questions that everybody asks or, you know, like a lot of mental health stuff comes up and, you know, um, how do you deal with anxiety and stay creative? How do you deal with depression and, and keep creating things like that? So. Um, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been interesting to, to run those, that side of things. It also, um, as much as I love the orbit work, uh, a lot, a part of, a lot of my job is mentoring artists as they come up through the ranks. And, um, so, you know, that, that kind of supports my orbit work as much as, as orbit supports that. And are you finding as this process goes along, the questions are changing or is it still a lot of the same 10 questions again and again and again? Well, I think now that there's so much documentation about those those questions that everybody has, people are reading those and then asking better, more developed versions of those questions or deeper versions of those questions. So I feel like now that we're actually documenting all of this knowledge online, the questions are actually getting much more interesting and, and important and deeper. So, so that's I think, fantastic. Yeah, I think that's great. And uh, so you mentioned how uh, you've got Artisticon coming up. Uh, what else uh, can folks look forward to that's coming out? Oh boy, uh, Artisticon's coming up and Spectrum is coming up. Um, I haven't figured out all of the cons that I'm doing, but I always do IlixCon in Philadelphia, in Reading, Pennsylvania, not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, at the end of the year, usually the weekend before Halloween. So I'm always at that. Um, and then I'm kind of always floating around a little bit. I, I didn't go to, Gen I, didn't think that I'm going to Gen Con this year, but I may end up there. Um, sometimes it's hard to stay away when you get offers from places to come and like do portfolio reviews, like come and hang out and, you know, with all the gamers and do portfolio reviews, like, oh, twist my arm. <laughs> you know? Now, uh, what, what's involved with the portfolio reviews? Uh, so what usually happens at a portfolio review is it's like 10 or 15 minute time slots and uh, someone comes in and it can be, you know, like all all levels kind of come in. Sometimes it's very professional artists that just haven't met you in person before and they want to like, you know, make, meet you um, and hopefully get some work from you. A lot of times it's students or new artists like a year or two out and they, um, it takes a long time to develop that uh, self-awareness of exactly what you need to work on in your art. So sometimes it's just really helpful to hear from an, from an art director, you know, like, you need to work on your anatomy some more or like your little work. Hey, get this Andrew Loomis book. It's all about composition and thumbnails. That would really help you. Or sometimes a lot of times uh, artists don't know where their art is going to fit. So it seems, it seems silly to, to from the outside if you're not an artist, but sometimes you're making art and you, and you don't know if it looks like a book cover, if it looks like a gaming piece and you just need a professional opinion. Like, you know, a lot of times people come to me and I'm like, well, your, your work, I know you're coming to talk to me as a book cover designer, but your work looks more like Dungeons and Dragons or Magic the Gathering. So you should go talk to this art director or this art director. So it's kind of like routing people a lot of the times. Um, it's kind of like speed dating, honestly. <laughs> Professional speed dating? Yeah, because you sit down and within like 10 seconds, you're trying to gauge like where this person is at, like what they're looking for and how to help them. And then you've got like eight minutes left. <laughs> Now, were you ever on the other side of that line, or have you always been lucky to sort of be the uh, the reviewer? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think 
I, I like to think that I'm nicer than some of the portfolio reviews that I had. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> the design world uh, can be slightly meaner than the illustration world. So I had some rough portfolio reviews coming up. I definitely, um, I definitely had uh, an art director from like Rolling Stone completely shit over my portfolio, like senior year of college. And I, I, I still cringe to think about that, um, which makes me, I think, a more, um, a really nice portfolio reviewer. Like I'm very, I feel like my maternal side comes out in portfolio reviews. I'm like, oh, honey, it's going to be okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you're, you're providing very specific therapy. Well, also, no matter where somebody is at skill level wise, you just need to give them the next step forward. You know, sometimes it's, you know, you should, you should work on, on your anatomy more. Or sometimes if it's somebody's portfolio is fantastic and they just don't know where their work fits or they don't know how to get in touch with the right art director, then you just say, okay, well, e I'll, I'll email this person and introduce you or, you know, see the guy with the ponytail, like that's the art director from this, like go talk to him, you know? So sometimes it's just pointing people in the right direction. Excellent. Uh, well, okay, so that's a, a big group of cons where folks can find you. You mentioned Necronomicon. Um, I guess given that this is a Lovecraft uh, sort of themed show, how did you get interested in Lovecraft in that world as well? Was that kind of through comics, through the kind of like Ditko sort of crazy, you know, or, uh, you know, Jack Kirby, you know, crackles and whatnot? Embarrassingly, I came to Lovecraft a little later. Um, I really, I knew, yeah, you too. I knew, too. I knew Edgar Allan Poe and I knew Anne Rice. And, and like Stephen King, and I didn't really know much in between. Um, and I knew so much comic stuff and everything. So by the time I actually read Lovecraft, I was in college and I remember reading it and being like, oh, this is what literally everyone I like has read. I get it now, you know, like I get it. Um, so it was a little embarrassing. <laughs> Um, I think somebody at the, I also worked at a comic book store in Boston for a few years when I was up there. Um, and I think somebody at the comic book store was like, you don't know who Lovecraft is. And I was in new England at this point And they were like, get ye to Providence, you know? And, <laughs> but I, I filled in the blanks very quickly. <laughs> but, well, you know, for me, you know, I knew him through gaming. Like I knew him through Call of Cthulhu and like Illuminati and just, you know, the name Cthulhu was just out there, but I didn't read him until even later than you, until my, my late twenties, really until a friend asked me to play Lovecraft was when I was like, Oh, okay, sure. I'll do this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll find out about this guy. And so, and that's, that's an interesting thing, right? I mean, you talk about being into comics in high school, right? And being, in, you know, like there's things about the genres and the fandoms and the loves we develop as teenagers. That's very different from the stuff we discover in our twenties or thirties or forties, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and yeah, there's a less, I feel like I'm less defensive about a lot of stuff in Lovecraftiana, despite the fact that I like pretend to be him. <laughs> I was going to say, you literally embody the good parts. There's some, there's some shady parts. That well, and that's, I mean, that's a huge thing, right? Like that's something that's, you know, I didn't realize until I sort of, you know, was invited into the Lovecraft world, just how contentious his racial views are. And even his conversations around some of the more like shadier side of things. I've been cosplaying as a monster. <laughs> well, I mean, I knew that enough because I got into it playing, uh, doing a play about him and his wife, right? So like, I knew about his anti-Semitism. I knew about this, but I just didn't realize how controversial it was. Like right. I thought, okay, yes, we understand that this guy had these really terrible views that we know are terrible. But the fact that just talking about it was seen as some sort of violation of like a secret compact that, you know, everyone knew you don't talk about this stuff. Well, and that's not the case anymore. I, it's, I mean, but it still comes up, right? Like anytime I see yeah. an article about Lovecraft and race, you know, I'll see 800 comments about man of this time, man of this time, you know, OUSJW, like, why do you have to keep bringing this up? And I feel like this stuff is gonna come up because people are gonna keep reading Lovecraft. Like yeah, we won't. <laughs> Like, we won't stop talking about this because we all agree. We'll stop talking about this if no one cares about him anymore. Right. But also, I mean, we are still, although great strides have been made in representation in genre, there's still a very far way to go. I mean, you're talking to a woman who has gotten death threats because of book covers she has designed for my female authors and my black authors, um, because people... Uh, like, those very covers that you showed, the Anne Leckie covers... Um, we, These I, excellent, excellent covers. I got death threats about 
because those covers didn't warn people that they were feminist. So people felt that, not that the book is feminist, but I guess I, they didn't see Anne on the cover. I don't know. They were alarmed that- um, <laughs> That there was gonna be like, like, like playing with gender ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but gender comes up as a as a interesting concept in those books. And but but again, I wouldn't call those books feminist at all uh, by the definition of feminist. But um, people wanted to return the books because the cover tricked them into thinking it was a normal sci fi fantasy book, and they were not happy with me for tricking them into buying a space book. But it is a space, like. So we're no, it's it's that, like, there's there's that there's that interesting like subversive line in science fiction, right? Like it's meant to be pushing the boundaries. It's meant to be making people think about things. But then, it's also very conservative, right? It's still it's like the genre of Heinlein and the genre of like you know Clark and folks who you know had very you know very advanced views maybe about technology, but socially you know like. Arthur C. Clarke is talking about like, we can't have women on in, in zero G because their bosoms will distract all the other officers. It's like, oh, that's awkward. <laughs> like Arthur C. Clarke had never seen a sports bra. <laughs> I, I guess not. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, you know. Um, but right, like there's that, there, there is that interesting, like we, we expect this to be like out of this world and pushing the boundaries, but not in ways that actually make me uncomfortable. Right. Well, because I think it, I think part of it is how many of us ended up as geeks because uh, it was our safe space. Like to, we felt, um, maybe I'm sort of speaking for myself, but we were bullied for things. We were made to feel weird about things that we liked. You know, we were, we considered ourselves not normal or outsiders in some way. So I think people who already consider themselves outsiders and find their space are, are extra super protective of that. There we go. One more, uh, one more glitch for the, <laughs> for the road. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, Lauren's talking about that that sense of of feeling like the space no longer belongs to you, or it's being it's being attacked. You know, and I've definitely seen this in in the Lovecraft world. You know, people think talking about Lovecraft and his views is not only an attack on Lovecraft, but an attack on them. And it's yeah, it's not. I mean, I'm sure there are some people out there who are like, "Oh, you're a racist for liking Lovecraft," but I mean, people say a lot of dumb stuff, right? Like if you're, if you agree with the racist things that Lovecraft said, then yes, you're being racist, but just liking someone, like liking his work or finding inspiration in his work, like, I don't know, like we should be, this comes up a lot, uh, this idea of we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable with our yeah. art that we like. Can you hear me yet? I can hear you, hello. Hi. Yes, you're back, hello. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right, so, um, yeah, I think when that safe space is feels threatened, I think it's it's extra alarming to folks. And but again, I mean, like, how can you be a fan of maybe a butler and not, you know, be empathetic? But also, I mean, even some of the creators. I mean, Ender's Game is one of my favorite books of all time. Yet Orson Scott Card is kind of a problematic yeah person. Yeah, you know, it's very hard to. Um, because we have conversations about that all the time, you know, at work, but both in the art community. Can you love the work divorced from not loving the creator? You know, and I and I think you can, um, but you can't deny that that creator, like you can't completely divorce the work from the creator. You can acknowledge that the work can be greater than the creator. What? Well, well, everything is just in context, right? I mean, as we talked about, you know, Lovecraft is a brand. You know, like, and people are interested in Lovecraft stuff, not just because of the words on the page, like, but because of who he is and his life and like his letters, like, you know, there's, it's the same thing with Stephen King, same thing with just any creator, right? Edgar Allan Poe, you know, his whole life, you know, has this like sort of poetic, dark, romantic air to it that, that both feeds into his stories and the stories feed back into him. And we live in that. And it's very, I don't know. I feel like it's very human. Yeah. Like, and we should we should celebrate and recognize the humanity even when it's not comfortable. Yeah. No, I I I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think I, you know I, I think it's sad that anybody who has ever been bullied or felt like an outsider would then turn around and bully or make other people feel like an outsider in the same way. And I just you know I hope that. You know, I've seen trolls turn around um, and I've had trolls apologize to me. Um, 
that, you know, really kind of hated me until they actually listened to kind of what I was saying sometimes. Um, and I, and I've had people turn around and say, you know what, I was really a jerk and, you know, I felt threatened and I'm sorry. So, you know, there's hope. Um, you wrote a really great article for Muddy Colors uh, just last month, all about cultural appropriation. Can you kind of talk about what prompted that and, <laughs> and sort of what the response to that has been? Because I really, I really well, appreciated that. So you can bait in the trolls. Um, so a lot of artists, especially in sci-fi fantasy, are concerned about the concept of cultural appropriation because especially a lot of concept artists use inspiration from different cultures and, and remix it and use it as inspiration for costumes or weapons or things like that. And that's fine. Um, a lot of artists though see discussions about cultural appropriation online. So what the difference is, just a shorthand, cultural appropriation means taking something uh, out of the context of a culture and, and either divorcing it from its origins completely or disrespecting it in some way um, or disrespecting something sacred. So the ex examples that come up a lot are like girls at music festivals wearing uh, Native American feather headdresses, um, which were actually really sacred objects, um, but are just kind of used as fashion accessories and not, you know, nobody completely divorced of where they're from. Um, or, you know, white celebrities wearing their hair in cornrows or African American styles and them being able to do that and being lauded for being edgy while African American girls are are sent home from school because they're not allowed to have natural hairstyles. So that's where appropriation comes in. Cultural exchange is when you respect another culture and use their influences back and forth. And that's fine. And I think most artists fall on the side of cultural exchange and not appropriation. Um, but it's just good to do your research. That's pretty much all the article said. It was do your research, respect where the context that these uh, things are coming from, and that's it. And all artists should wanna do visual research anyway. So it wasn't saying anything groundbreaking, but because I said the words cultural appropriation, I got a ton of trolls chasing me because I was being political, and how dare you say this, and how dare you say that. And I was very careful to have zero politics in that article, and um, Dan Dos Santos, who uh, runs Muddy Colors, also went through my article and was like, this one's going to be a hot topic. Let's make sure there's nothing controversial in here. But, you know, people, the the people that trolled me on that article, like the very first comment was a troll, like insulting my intelligence and telling me I had too much free time. Like those people weren't even reading the article. They just saw the title that it was an article about cultural appropriation, skipped all the way to the comments and like let loose. If anybody actually read the article, there was nothing political in it at all. It was just saying like, do your research, you know, that's it. So, but you know, people, people hate a green haired liberal girl. So. Uh, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. Oof. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, both writing that and uh, being able to talk about that. Cause I think, yeah, I think the more we're able to talk about this stuff, the better, I yeah. don't know. Like, I think the conversation is important. And I don't want artists to feel like they, like, I don't want a white artist to feel like they can't illustrate a, a black person. I don't want, you know, a black artist to think they can't illustrate a, a, a Mexican person, you know, or their culture or whatever it, you know, like, I don't want artists to feel like they shouldn't do something because it's not their culture. Art's going to get really narrow if we're only allowed to write about what <laughs> we know, paint, a, paint what we know, things like that. So I just wanted to put a lot of people's minds at ease. Um, you know, with, with the point of view of just definitions of what it was and what it wasn't with, you know, and I'm, I'm acknowledging my privilege too. I'm a white, able-bodied woman, you know, um, so I link to a lot of resources from, from voices within different communities and different ethnicities and, and their views on what cultural appropriation is and not. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for coming on the show. If folks want to learn more about you, more about your work, where are some of the best places uh, they can go? Well, if you're interested in Orbit and my work there, it's orbitbooks.net. If you're interested in all the art business and educational resources, that's drawnanddrafted.com, um, which we giggle because it's also D&D, &D, but not that D&D. &D. <laughs> um, and then I have a website if you're just interested in me and like FAQs and like articles I've read, I've written and things like that. Um, you can just go to laurenpanapinto.com. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everyone watching. Uh, if you're interested in this show, this is Ask Lovecraft After Dark. It's the sister show to my uh, seven year long web series, Ask Lovecraft, uh, where I impersonate HP Lovecraft uh, uh, three times a week for reasons that are anybody's guess. Uh, <laughs> folks, uh, 
can uh, watch that at AskLovecraft.com. Uh, it's, uh, you can follow it on Twitter at uh, AskLovecraft. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of these live conversations, these live shows, you can uh, join us on Facebook at the Ask Lovecraft Appreciation Society. Uh, you can follow me personally, Screaming Into the Void, on Twitter at Lehman Kessler. And if you want to know about live shows, uh, speaking about cultural appropriation, <laughs> I just did a Peter Sellers uh, a, a series uh, for a local group uh, and decided not to do any of his brown or yellow face characters because oh, that would have been that would have been a little much, mm. a little much. As much as I love Murder by Death. I wasn't going to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but you can find it. <laughs> you can find about those live shows at LeibenKessler.com. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. This has been super fun. Yeah, thank you so much, Lauren. We'll have you on again sometime. I'll, until then, I'll be seeing you on the con circuit. Bye. Bye.